President Trump and I have a mission. America leads on Earth and in space. We're going back to the moon. And this time, when we plant our flag, we stay. Numerous plans are currently underway to begin building infrastructure and habitats on the moon, aiming to establish a permanent human presence. However, even the most ambitious of these efforts focus primarily on small-scale lunar bases, research outposts, and settlements designed to support only a few dozen people at most. A true lunar city would need to go far beyond these early concepts. It would require a much larger scale, the ability to operate with full self-sufficiency for extended periods, and the infrastructure to support a permanent, thriving community. Such a city would need to provide a safe, comfortable, and fully sustainable environment for both long-term residents and temporary visitors alike. This is how NASA built the first permanent city on the moon. Building a city on the moon would require an enormous amount of infrastructure and equipment to be transported from Earth. This kind of effort would place a huge strain on NASA's already tight budget, especially as the agency juggles multiple high-priority projects. To make this vision feasible, we need to reduce the cost of launching materials to the moon or increase the amount we can transport in a single launch. Fortunately, NASA now has access to a vehicle that can do both, SpaceX's Starship. This fully reusable rocket is designed to carry at least 100 metric tons of cargo to the Moon or Mars in a single mission. Starship could play a critical role in enabling NASA's long-term plans for a sustainable lunar presence. If we set a mass budget of around 100,000 metric tons, the amount needed to build a functioning lunar city, that would require about 1,000 Starship landings. While that might sound ambitious, it's worth noting that SpaceX already plans to send 1,000 starships to Mars, a much more distant and challenging destination. So using the same number of launches for the Moon, a far closer and more accessible target, is not as unrealistic as it might seem. So, where exactly would we build this lunar city? NASA is currently preparing to return astronauts to the Moon under the Artemis program, and it has identified 13 candidate landing regions near the lunar south pole. These areas are scientifically significant due to their proximity to permanently shadowed regions, craters that never see sunlight, and are believed to contain water ice and other valuable resources. These areas also remain largely unexplored by humans. One location stands out among the options, the Shackleton de Gerlache Ridge. This ridge, situated between the Shackleton and de Gerlache craters, is a highly illuminated area ideal for generating solar power and maintaining communication with Earth. It's already been highlighted as a potential landing site for Artemis III, the first crewed mission of the Artemis program. Within that region, the rim of de Gerlache crater appears especially promising. It offers access to two nearby PSRS, with high potential for containing volatiles like water ice. The area also features manageable slopes for travel between sunlit terrain and the shadowed regions. Its combination of reliable sunlight, Earth visibility, and access to vital resources makes it an optimal site for a future lunar settlement. Let's get started on building our moon base. The very first principle in planning a lunar settlement is that you want to rely as much as possible on materials that are already there. Every pound of rock or resource you use from the moon is one less pound you have to launch all the way from Earth, which means a huge savings in both cost and energy. In fact, for every kilogram of material we can produce using resources found on the moon, we can save more than 61 million joules of energy. And in case you're not familiar, a joule is the standard unit of energy in the international system of units. It's defined as the amount of energy transferred when a force of one newton moves something one meter. So, yeah, saving millions of joules per kilogram is a big deal. To make that happen, the moon's surface, known as lunar regolith, becomes incredibly important. It's full of elements that can be put to use in construction and manufacturing. The regolith contains oxygen, iron, titanium, silicon, magnesium, and aluminum, all of which are key ingredients in making useful building materials. Silicon, for instance, can be used to make strong glass. Titanium and aluminum are excellent for structural components. 
Even oxygen isn't wasted. It can be used to produce ceramics. There are already chemical processes that can turn lunar regolith into metals, ceramics, glass, powders, and fibers. And these technologies have been built and tested here on Earth. One of the most promising methods is called the hydrofluoric acid leach system, which breaks down the regolith to extract usable materials efficiently. But it's not just theory anymore. Real-world testing is already underway. One experiment, called the Redwire Regolith Print Project, was launched to the International Space Station to test how 3D printing with lunar-like materials works in microgravity. It uses a device called the Made in Space Manufacturing Device, or MAN-D for short, which is already on the space station and built specifically for zero-gravity 3D printing. The regolith print system includes specially designed extruders and print beds that work with the MAN-D printer to process regolith simulants. The main goal of the project is to prove that this kind of manufacturing can actually work in space. A secondary goal is to produce printed samples that scientists can study and analyze back on Earth. So, what can you actually build with a regolith 3D printer? Pretty much anything you need. Landing pads, roads, even habitats on the lunar surface. Roads, in particular, would be a game changer for any future moon colony. That's because lunar dust is no joke. It's ultra-fine, extremely abrasive, and sticks to everything. Back during the Apollo 17 mission, when the lunar rover lost its rear fender, the dust kicked up during driving coated the vehicle so badly that it started to overheat. The astronauts had to improvise a fix using pieces of lunar maps. The problem isn't just theoretical, either. The Soviet Union's Lunokhod 2 rover is believed to have failed due to overheating after lunar dust covered its radiator. And NASA's current models suggest that whenever a lander touches down, its rocket thrusters can blow away tons of dust, blasting it in all directions. That dust can then stick to equipment, cover nearby structures, and cause serious damage over time. The most practical way to deal with this issue is to pave over key areas, like landing zones and roads, to keep the dust under control. One option is to 3D print bricks from lunar material and use them like pavers. But there's another clever method that dates back to 1933, melting sand to form solid roadways. In the case of the moon, that means melting lunar dust itself. The European Space Agency explored this idea through a project called PAVER, short for Paving the Road for Large Area Centering of Regolith. They tested whether this old-school concept could work on the moon by using a 12-kilowatt carbon dioxide laser to melt simulated moon dust into a smooth, glass-like surface. The results showed real promise for creating durable, dust-proof lunar roads. ESA clarified that they wouldn't actually bring a big carbon dioxide laser to the moon. The laser was simply a stand-in for lunar sunlight. In practice, the same melting effect could be achieved by focusing natural sunlight using a Fresnel lens just a couple of meters across. That kind of setup could generate enough heat to center or melt the regolith right where it lies, forming strong, paved surfaces directly on the moon's surface. Now, what will our first home on the moon actually look like? In the initial missions, astronauts will live inside the same lander that brings them to the lunar surface. This human landing system will double as short-term lodging, equipped with life support systems to sustain small crews for brief stays. But looking ahead, the vision becomes far more ambitious. NASA plans to establish a fixed habitat at the Artemis Base Camp, capable of supporting up to four astronauts for stays of up to 30 days. This habitat will be part of a broader lunar base infrastructure, which also includes a surface transport vehicle for short-range missions, a pressurized rover for longer excursions, systems to generate power, and technologies that can harvest and utilize local lunar resources. At the heart of this base will be the surface habitat, a permanent, multifunctional structure located near the lunar south pole. This habitat will serve as a home base for astronauts, a communications hub, a scientific research center, a repair and maintenance site for spacesuits and equipment, a logistics and supply depot, and a waste processing facility. The design of the habitat is both practical and innovative. It features a two-story inflatable living section mounted vertically, supported by a metallic core and a rigid lower section. This lower section allows astronauts to enter and exit during extravehicular activities and facilitates the movement of supplies and equipment. 
Between the outer hatch and the main interior lies a two-chamber airlock system, which allows astronauts to transition safely between the harsh lunar environment and the pressurized interior. Spacesuit maintenance can be performed either within the airlock itself or inside the main habitat. The entire structure stands about 7.8 meters tall, not including solar panels or the lander, and has an inflated diameter of 6.5 meters. Remarkably, it's compact enough to be launched in a rocket fairing just 5 meters wide. The habitat's layered construction includes an inner air bladder, structural restraint layers, protective shielding against micrometeoroids and space debris, and multi-layer insulation to guard against extreme temperature shifts. Of course, there are also more futuristic concepts, like a massive domed lunar city spanning 40 kilometers in diameter and rising 1,500 meters high, built over Shackleton Crater. However, whether it's this grand vision or the more immediate base camp plans, they all hinge on one critical factor, energy. Solar power, which has reliably supported past missions, becomes far less viable in this context due to the moon's long nights, which can last up to 14 Earth days. Sustaining a permanent, large-scale presence will require a far more robust and continuous energy solution. That's why NASA's acting administrator, Sean Duffy, is pushing so strongly to have a nuclear reactor operational on the moon by 2030. Unlike solar power, nuclear energy offers a consistent, high-output power source. By splitting atoms of uranium fuel, these reactors release a tremendous amount of energy in the form of heat, enough to sustain life support systems, power habitats, and enable industrial activity on the lunar surface. A nuclear reactor on the moon might sound dramatic, but it's neither illegal nor without precedent. If deployed responsibly, it could open the door to peaceful international exploration, economic development, and the testing of advanced technologies for future missions deeper into space. The moon itself is an ideal testing ground for space settlement and scientific progress. Its near-vacuum atmosphere is perfect for certain manufacturing processes and scientific experiments. The surface offers natural heat sources and sinks, valuable volatile materials for resource extraction, and varied terrain, cliffs, craters, and valleys that could be used for energy generation or shelter. The lunar regolith, composed of finely ground basalt and anorthosite, holds promise for construction and material processing. The extreme dryness of the moon enhances electrostatic effects, which could be useful for handling and sorting materials. Furthermore, the moon's stable surface makes it an excellent location for observatories. Its far side, permanently shielded from Earth's electromagnetic interference, provides a pristine environment for deep space radio astronomy and other sensitive observations. So, do you want to live in a city on the moon?